give you a title. So I guess you can call this uh, in your notes a vector as a derivative, which ruins the surprise, but um, at least you know them what I'm doing. So consider a differentiable function which I will call f, and it's of n coordinates, so it's a n dimensional function. So f of x1 all the way to x n. So a few of you were maybe confused about my notation, but what I mean simply is if you're working in two dimensions, then the typical thing is to set x1 equal to x, x2 is equal to y, right? So then f of x1, x2 is just f of x1. So this is a generic way of writing for any coordinate. So just so this may be more familiar. But it's a different differential function that takes n arguments in, so it's n. Okay. And this function I define on my manifold, which I called m last time. And the manifold has a dimension of m, so up to the function. Fine. I don't know why I started writing on the middle board. Okay. So consider a differential function f defined on the manifold m of dimension m. Okay, such that my function f maps m to the real line. All right. That's my function. It maps m to all. Right. So it's a scalar. In this same manifold, consider a curve, any curve, which I will denote as gamma, as you may have used in your modular. So that symbol here is the Greek letter capital gamma. So it's just some curve. And this curve I will define. Uh, parametric here. Defined parametrically by the equation xi is equal to xi of lambda with i equals to 1. Yes, yes, yes. Always. Okay. So for, for, from right now, when I put in the upper, I mean the label on the just the label. Does everybody know what I mean by parametrically? So you did this in polar coordinates, and you had an R curve and the And lambda is just my uh, my parameter. So when you do a, in your second year calculus course, if you remember, when you talk about parametrized curve, you pick a parameter like t or lambda. So I'm using lambda to be my uh, parameter. And xi means x1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you have a set of equations that parametrically defines this curve. Fine. And you've done this in your calculus course because you used to do polar coordinates and r plots and r theta plots. Very good. So along this curve, so along gamma, The values of this function, xi, are given as function of lambda, which is our parameter, so that the value of f x1 to xn, although I don't need to write it this time, I'll just do it now, is in fact 
a function of lambda. Oh, no. So f is a function of x1, x2, x3, xn, but each x is a function of lambda. So this way I actually parameterize the function along the curve. Okay. Thus, we can define a function, or I should say, yeah, a function of lambda, say, g of lambda, to be the value of f, x i lambda, all the way to x n lambda, along my curve, which is what I just said. Along this. So by picking a curve, any old curve, gamma in my manifold, and assuming that curve can be defined parametrically, I also parameterize my function. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, thank you. Yes. Okay, so now let me ask you with this G of lambda function, what is its derivative? So, what is dg by d? Any ideas? If g of lambda is defined as f of x of i of lambda, what is dg of lambda? <coughs> what do I need to use to define it? It starts with the ch chain. If g of lambda is equal to f of x of lambda, then dg by d lambda is given by the chain rule of life step. Right? Okay. So then, dg by d lambda is equal to dxi by d lambda times partial f being used. I'm not actually specified in F and G. So this definition is actually completely general, irrespective to any F or G you want to. I didn't say F should be this and G should be that. I just said there's some F and there's some G. So this derivative then is completely general for any F and for any G. Okay. So, realistically what I had, if I just ignored the F and G that are there, I have an operator. Namely, that d by d lambda is equal to the sum as i equals 1 to n, d x i by d lambda partial by partial. So the idea is this operates on some function, right? So I've left that part by fill in whatever function you want. Okay. So this idea is completely general, this derivative idea. But look what we've done. So, look what we did. So clearly, the 
Third. Gamma, which is a path you can think of in M, determine d by d. So the curve itself in M, which is completely arbitrary, determines what this derivative operator should be, d by d. And does anybody know, if you've taken multivariable calculus, this actually should be very familiar what this is. <coughs> Think about it. It's a very specific type of derivative. You've done this if you've done very close. What so what is the concept related to the gradient? The direction of derivative. Yes. This is the direction of derivative over there. You see, these are the gradient, and then you have this other component. So in fact, what we have done is the directional derivative along them. Okay. But let me now expand on this a little. Because it should be clear how this relates to the idea of vectors. So let's do something. So now, but this is the main result, so keep this in mind. Now suppose that there is some other curve. And for lack of a better word, I will call it theta. So what curve is gamma? Now suppose there's another curve called theta. And it passes through some point P. Some point called P. Okay. And pretend now, before, just to keep things clear, I parameterized the first curve by lambda. Now I will parameterize this curve by some other number called tau. A lot of Greek letters, and all the Greek people are not here to experience it. Where did they go? And this is parameterized by some Greek letter called it. It's just convention to use Greek letters there. So similarly then, for this one, I can also write down the direction of the river. Consider the linear combination of the two vectors. We can consider the linear combination, namely A times D by D lambda, which is the first one, plus B times D by D tau. So the linear combination of my and what do we get if we evaluate it? So if I put d by d lambda, that expression is here, and this expression is this one, what do you get? You get the point. So I'll just write out the summation sign. You get a dx i by d lambda plus b dx i by d tau times, once again, this partial by partial. That is it. OK, so what? What difference does that make? 
every time I have the suspense of going to make, it gets ruined because I have to erase the board. So you have to wait like two more minutes. But look what we've done here. The coefficients of this are just numbers. Dx by i by d tau is just a number. This is just a number. You see that? These are just numbers. So this is just a number. This is just a number. And what I raised before, that coefficient was just a number. So, since the coefficient, you see what I've done here in both relationships, in my d by d lambda, d by d tau here, this is the factor that stays the same in all formulations. But it's multiplied by some number in each situation. So the coefficients of these partial derivatives are just numbers. So since the coefficients of my d by dx i's are real numbers, this must also be a vector. The linear combination. So it seems that this thing I keep writing down, this d by dxi, can be thought of as a set of basis vectors. Very strange. just standard old linear algebra. And you'll see the analogy immediately. So let me explain. My claim is that these things I've written down are vectors. And my further claim is that these partial derivative things are basis vectors. But you know this, because if I give you some three-dimensional plane and some point there, call it, I don't know, the components dx, or maybe components that say 1, 2, 3, how do you write this vector down? Suppose I label the vector v, and this is x, y, z, and this is v. How can I write this equation for this vector? Is that 2 by f, z, 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 z
Because they remain independent, they stand on them. I can therefore write any vector, say d by d size. as a linear combination, just like I did with my three-dimensional plane. As a linear combination of these basic things. And the coefficients of each vector now are just these numbers. With coefficients, Coefficient. Just given by the x1, by the side, all the way to the x and so that's our generalization. Instead of ax hat plus by hat plus cz hat, now I have these derivatives, and the x hat, y hat, z hat now have been replaced with these partial and it's very easy how we got this because it's just using chain rule on some arbitrary curve. That's where we started. So therefore, what have we done? We have defined our vector field on our curve space. This is how we do it. Yes? Yeah. Oh, 
Okay. Okay. Now you can imagine that at any point, remember, so all this is defined in the neighborhood of some point P. At this point P, you can have many tangent points. We have ten of them at any single point. And so at any point P, you have n tangent vectors that we have a linear space at some point P of these vectors. Okay? So therefore, we say that the set of tangent vectors at my point P defines what we call the tangent space. And I denote this tangent space by the following funny notation. T for tangent space, P for being the tangent space at that point P as a function of that. That's the thing. So at any point, you have a set of tangent vectors, and a collection of those tangent vectors form a tangent space, as you would expect. A collection of vectors forms a tangent space at this point. Oops. So it just holds in the neighborhood of T. Exactly. And that makes Keep that in mind, yes, very good. So it's a local definition. But then, which is what he alluded to, this tangent space is just defined within some neighborhood of one point, P. But I have millions of points in my mind, infinite many. So what do I do? How do I combine it? Combine it? What? At every point, P in M, so many points P in M, we can define a vector space. So that's my TP. I'm just rewriting it so it's clear. And further, the union of all of these possible spaces over each point. Commonly known notation is called the tangent bundle. Tangent. And we denote this simply as T. And it's defined, as I said, as the union of all possible tangent spaces. So it's defined as union P. You have a manifold, which is some general space, it could be curved, whatever. You want to talk about vectors. So at each point at this, I define a vector space, which is a collection of n tangent vectors at each point. But I have many points, so I have many tangent spaces. Right? So think of your sphere once again. You'll have some tangent space there. You'll have some tangent space. You have some tangent space. And so, you have infinitely many. And the collection of all these times is the tangent bundle. Very good. So that's my little summary of the differential geometry you will need in this course. But now, any questions on so I cannot go too further with this. It's because 
Ironically, you need to understand the differential equation to make further than this. So it's a very weird duality. I, I need this to understand differential equations, but I need differential equations to understand this one. It's a very confusing point we're at right now. But does everybody understand so far, more or less? Okay. So now let's, how does this then relate to the nonlinear dynamical system? So let's go back. Let's go way, way back. But now you know all this. So if I give you an exam on these questions, you'll be able to do it. Yes? Uh, <laughs> Don't joke, I may actually do it. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> no, the final, final exam. These could be the thinking questions I was uh, hinting at. Yeah, like one question could be, give all possible charts of a uh, Mobius script or something like this. No, I, I will not, I will not. Maybe. Okay. okay, so let's go back to the analysis. But now we know that this is our general space, obviously systems are defined. So back to the analysis. I will just write BS, I don't want to keep any on the analysis. Okay. So, if you've forgotten what a dynamical system is, let me remind you. So we wish to study systems, maybe they're physical systems, where the state of this system at time t, let's say, can be described by an element or points for better word. Which is our And in other books, I, I believe when I do linear systems, I call M state space. So it's, as your manifold is a state space. It's just a collection of points. So we used to study systems where the state of the system at time t can be described by an element of point of time. Whose evolution is governed by an anonymous or autonomous set of differential equations? On where we wrote, if you remember, dx vector for dt. So x is a vector of this one. Equal to this arbitrary function. And further, now I can tell you where all these things are defined because we know not the background here. that goes from my manifold to my panel. Because these are vector fields. Remember, my goal was, if this is on some general geometry, how do I talk about this now? Now I know. My vector field must be a function that goes from M to T. Say tangent space, or tangent mode. Which assigns to each point, call it M, in my mind, a vector in T, M, that's how I do this. For this course, though, I must now stop here. 
I cannot go further than this because we need more partial differential equations than Riemannian geometry. So for the rest of this course, we will consider where my manifold M is actually R to make life simple. But it turns out, first of all, two things. Everything we have done generalizes to either case. So everything I will write now in the future will work for M. And furthermore, um, it's easy to do. And 99.9% .9 of dynamical systems can be completely described in R. You don't have to go too much. You can. Sometimes it's more helpful. But everything we will do will be completely general. So, if m is equal to rn, so m is in fact just the rn space, what is the tangent space of rn? It's very simple. So if my manifold now is rn, what is the tangent bundle of rn? Very good. Why is it? Everybody. Does everybody hear that? No. Okay. If rn is just the Space you're dealing with, then what is the collection of tangent vectors to Rn? It's just another collection of vectors. Yes? So therefore, I can take F to be a function that goes from Rn to Rn. So that will help me a lot. My function now is just defined from Rn to Rn, so therefore I can cover both the both. So my vector x then, which I've been writing in the dx by t of f of x, is just this time, x1 to fn, is just a collection of points, and yeah. So you can imagine now what this evolution now is saying, is you have a vector described by these coordinates, and this tells you how that vector changes in. Hence the differential. But because it's n dimensional, you have n of these equations. So a system of dimensions. Okay. So for, uh, I will use either notation, but sometimes, in fact, most of the times, I will just denote dx by dt as simply x prime. So you don't get confused there. Or x dot. All these things. Where x, of course, is in part. And dimensional vectors, or collection of them. Okay. And further off, my vector field, which is also a function from Rn to Rn, is just a collection of x. So something f1 of x all the way to x. That's what I've been meaning by the field. Okay. So now we can extend this definition. As well. So there are some special types of dynamical systems, one we've been already doing, which is the so just to give you some more introduction, there are special types of dynamical systems. The first one which we did already was with F was just A. So linear. So where F of X is just some constant matrix times X. This is our famous linear system. So if you remember we wrote on X prime is equal to A. So that's one possibility. There's another special class, which are called a gradient dynamical system. And this simply occurs if F is a gradient of some scalar field. Namely that f of x is 
equal to minus such two. Now, Z, where Z is minus two. So you've seen this in your multivariate stuff. So if you have some special F that's written like this, which is the gradient of the scalar field, this is a special type of diamond called the gradient diamond. Okay. So in this case, you just have x prime is equal to minus del z. So non-linear And you can also have a further one, which I will not get to because it's not a physics course, but if this was the previous course, I would do this here. But they're called Hamiltonian dynamics. But I will not go into any further details, although I really wish I could. Right? It's actually very much related to a lot of the stuff you do in TDs next year, but I don't want to go too side. <coughs> okay. So those are just some examples of dynamic systems. So let's go now more into if I give you a dynamic system, a nonlinear one, what do you do with it? How do you actually do something? We've done a lot of theory so far, but I've not actually told you how to do anything with these <laughs> Which is often not worse than that. Anyway, so you can kind of start that, and then I will finish up next. Week. Okay, so some basic. So we want to solve these systems of equations. So what does it mean to have a solution? So basically, a solution of the dynamical system, x vector prime is equal to f of x, on Rn, so instead of m, I'm specifically doing Rn, is a function, which I will denote by psi, let's say, that goes from R to Rn, which satisfies phi prime of t is equal to f phi. So, if you want to solve this differential equation or system of equation, and your claim is that the psi is the solution to this, in other words, x is equal to psi. Psi then should satisfy this equation, right? And if it satisfies this equation, then therefore psi is the solution to this other equation. Okay, so all these are connected. Uh, oh yeah, and this is the most important part. For all t. So for all t. It's a technical point, though, as you saw in the single dimension of these case, maybe it's not possible to find a solution for all time. And we'll talk about that in a second. So keep, this is a caveat. It could blow up or something like that, as we saw in the linear first book. So that's what you mean by solution. What else? What else can you say? And since Oh, yeah. And further, the image of phi of t in Rn is what we call the orbit of the dynamic. So by image, I just mean a picture of it. So you solve this dynamical system, you get a parameterization of, of a curve of 5p, and the sketch of those curves in R2, R3, or whatever, is what we call the orbit. This is just being drawn. It's called the orbit. And further, look 
carefully at this situation I written down in the box. Since phi prime of t is equal to f of phi of t plus phi of t, what am I saying? I'm saying that the vector field f is tangent to my solution. f of x is tangent to the order. So those who have done um, electromagnetism know the relationship between the gradient of the field and the tangent and all that stuff. Okay. So I will stop here, and next class I will talk about very briefly existence and unity. It's getting worse every day in terms of what I'm understanding. I do. All they do is literally just break it off. You just simplify it, simplify it, simplify it. Okay, you can do that on your own. Probably. Give it enough time.